I've met with a couple different couples in the last few months. I've just kind of met them in passing, and I found out they were planning a wedding. They were putting together all the logistics, all the things of a big ceremony. And I asked them just how that's going. And usually when you meet couples who are planning a wedding, you all know how those couples usually feel. They're a little stressed out. They're a little bit frantic. They're trying to put together all those details and the stress and the months and the expectations leading to that huge event. And so I've seen a few of these couples as they're in that preparation mode, and I asked them how they were doing, and I was taken aback by both of these couples because they told me they're doing really, really well. I was like, wow, well, what what'd you do? Did you unlock the secret? How would you remove all the stress? And they told me, well, it's because we're actually already married. And I said, huh? And then they explained that they fell in love during the pandemic. They fell in love, and they got engaged, wanted to be married, and as we know, especially last year, there were many restrictions on gatherings, on people coming together, and so they could not find a venue to get everyone together, so they decided to have private, small ceremonies, and now they're planning the big wedding with all the friends, all the guests. And I started thinking about that, that small ceremony, because they explained that one was actually the more stressful one. Not the big wedding, it was the small one. And the reason why was they had to figure out who are we going to invite? Because they were only allowed to have so many guests at these venues. And they had to determine who's going to be on that short list. Now put yourself in that seat. You're trying to plan the biggest event of your life. And you can only invite a few guests to come to the party. That is difficult. And it makes me think of another event, and it is the biggest event in all of human history. It took place about 2,000 years ago. It was such a big event, in fact, it changed history the way we even record it in our calendar system. And of course, that event was the birth of Christ. And when God was putting together a party, a celebration, the Bible tells us he actually only invited a few guests and when you think about who those guests would be, if you can only invite a few, you would think those that would be invited might be the most religiously pious and elite, perhaps the kings of the world and all of the political leaders. Yet when you look to this perfect Christmas story and you look at those guests, you realize that short list was filled with a bunch of people who fell short, that it was filled with imperfect guests. And today we're going to look at a few of those guests in particular. We're going to look at those wise men, those magi. And we're going to look to these quasi-pagan religious outsiders, these Gentiles that God invited to come to the party to celebrate the arrival of his son. And I want you to consider why is it, why is it that they made that guest list? And I would contend part of the reason is to make sure all of us know that God has room for us as well. God invited imperfect people to celebrate his perfect Savior, and he's still inviting imperfect people today. And as we look to this Christmas story and we look to these wise men, what we're going to find is they're going to teach us many wise lessons that if we take to heart today, it will help us meet with Jesus Christ this Christmas season. So if you have your Bible, join me. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 2 is where we're going to be, and we're going to look at these imperfect guests in this perfect Christmas story. And we're going to begin in verse 1. We're told, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. So let's just pause there to give a little bit of context. It says Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Now, if you were here last week, we looked at the imperfect circumstances that surrounded the birth of Christ. And if you remember, he was called to Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph, his parents, were sent there by order and decree of Caesar Augustus. But we talked about last week how truly it was God who made that decree through a human servant. And God sent Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem because the Messiah had to come through Bethlehem because God said it would be that way 700 years before. So Mary and Joseph, they providentially find their way to Bethlehem, that city of David, because Jesus is the son of David, and he's going to be delivered there. And we looked at those imperfect circumstances last week, how he was born in front of a couple scared teenage parents in a manger with a bunch of smelly animals. And the news has already come, words getting out, 
that he arrived. He's in Bethlehem. And in this story, the focus shifts to the days of Herod, the king. So Matthew paints the light on Herod, and Herod's known as Herod the Great. Luke, last week, you remember we talked about Caesar Augustus, the emperor, Caesar of Rome. But now you have Herod the king, the king of the Jews. And Matthew brings him up, and he's the first Herod that's mentioned in your New Testament, but there will be other Herods that will rise up. But he was known as Herod the Great. And his father actually was appointed by Julius Caesar to be the governor of Judea. And then he got his son, Herod, to be in charge of Galilee, and he rose up through the ranks, and as he led for the Romans as an Edomite over these Jews, he actually helped the Roman Empire by squashing some different Jewish revolts, so he rose in accolades. So years later, the Roman Senate, they call Herod the king of the Jews, reporting to Rome and the Caesar, but he's given this area to give authority and leadership to. And though he was an Edomite, he led like the king of the Jews. He administrated, he was a leader, and he lived like a king. We're told that he was really ambitious. If you know of anything about Herod, you know there's a reason why they called him the Great. It's because he built great palaces and fortresses, cities, theaters, and of course he extended and grew the temple as well. And because of that, Herod was known. He was this leader that had all of this power. In fact, he had at least nine wives because he took these wives for political purposes to extend his kingdom. But we also know about Herod that although he was quite the leader and the administrator, he was also ruthless. If you know anything about Herod the Great, you know that a lot of people didn't think he was so great. We're told he was constantly paranoid. He was worried that other people were going to come and take over his kingdom. We're told historically that he actually killed the high priest of Israel, that he had become suspicious of him, so he ordered for the high priest to be drowned. And that's bad enough, but he was also married to the high priest's sister. So then you fast forward just a little bit of time after that, he actually had his own wife killed and her mother, so he killed his mother-in-law. You fast forward a little bit of time, he killed three of his sons, and then Herod, when he's on his deathbed after this, years after this account, he knew that nobody was going to care that he was gone. So what did Herod do? He actually issued a decree to have some of the greatest leaders in Jerusalem thrown in jail immediately, and then he made the order, when I die, I want you to execute all of them. Because he said, if people aren't going to cry for me when I die, they're going to be crying for somebody. This is who Herod is. And Herod is the king of the Jews. He's a ruthless man. And all of a sudden, he gets news from these wise men from the east. Wise men show up, and they're looking for a king. Now, who are these wise men? And truthfully, there's a lot we don't know about these wise men. We always say three kings. We even sang it earlier, but we don't know if there were three kings. We truthfully do not know how many wise men showed up. That number three is always associated with the three gifts that we'll get to here shortly in the passage. But we don't know how many there were. We don't even know, frankly, where they came from, although most think it was probably from Babylon and hundreds of miles away, it says from the east. But who were wise men? They were historical figures that actually rose up during the 7th century B.C. because they became experts and studied in sacred writings and astrology and science and math and history and all of these sacred things in wisdom, literature, and they rose to prominence amongst the Babylonian and the Medo-Persian empires. In fact, they actually would be elevated at times as advisors, trusted advisors to those that were in authority. You remember when we went through the book of Daniel here in this place, it was actually wise men that were brought in as counsels to Nebuchadnezzar and rulers and leaders because they had an understanding of sacred things, even though they themselves were quasi-pagan Gentiles. But you see these leaders come in, and they've come to Jerusalem, and the reason why they came, we were told, is they saw a star. Now, why on earth would they come to Jerusalem just because of a star? You can presume that it was because they were familiar with the sacred writings. Because in Numbers chapter 24, there was a prophecy that was made about a king of Israel that would come, but he would come in a miraculous way. In Proverbs 24, verse 17, we're told, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So we were told in the Old Testament that a star would rise. 
And with that star, there would be a new star, a king that would actually come and arise out of Israel. And these wise men see the star and they follow it and it leads them to Jerusalem. And they're looking for this king. They've gone hundreds of miles and they're going around asking, where's the new king? Where's the new king? So they take them to the current king, King Herod. And look at how Herod reacts when he sees these wise men. It says in verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. And that word troubled, it really could be translated terrified. It's actually the same word that describes the disciples when they see Jesus walking on the water amidst the storm in Matthew 14. So Herod hears this. He sees that there's these wise men showing up and they're looking for a king, but it ain't him. And he's paranoid. He's worried. He's troubled. He's terrified. And the reason why is he has a title, but he's understanding there might be another king above him. But the wise men are there, and they aren't looking for Herod. In fact, what they're teaching us is our first point today. Wise men know that there's only one king. Wise men know there's only one king. They're brought to Herod, and he has a title as king, but that's not who they're looking for. They say he may have a title, but there's someone greater than him. I've watched basketball my whole life. I grew up playing it when I was younger, and I've always tracked basketball for as far back as I can remember. And of course, for the last 20 years, there's been one athlete that really has stolen all the headlines in basketball. It's LeBron James, which even if you don't know anything about basketball, you've probably heard the name LeBron James. And I remember LeBron James, even when he was in high school, if you track basketball, you know he became a sensation before he ever got to the NBA perhaps more so than any other adolescent athlete. LeBron James was on the, top, on the cover of magazines, became this, this next guy that was going to take the baton of basketball, the chosen one. And I remember when he was in high school, they would televise his basketball games on national television. Dick Vitale would do the commentating, stuff that had never happened before to a high school athlete. And then he, of course, was the number one overall pick in 2003, and he's played in the league for about 20 years, nearly. And he rose up quickly, was immediately an all-star, then became an MVP, then became a world champion. And because of that, people have always called LeBron James a certain nickname. Have you ever heard it? They call him King James, that he's the king. He's the king of basketball, and he's carried that title since, truthfully, he was a teenager. And I think about that title, King James. It's a little bit of a fraud because we all know Michael Jordan was better than him. Let's all be honest. He ain't really the king. All of us. And I'm glad y'all are all smiling because if you argue with me, you're going to lose. Michael Jordan is better than LeBron James. Yet LeBron has this title as the king. He's the king of basketball, the king, the chosen one. And it just shows you the fallacy of titles because so often you can have a title but it means actually nothing. There's always someone greater than you. doesn't matter what your title is. And Herod's coming to that understanding. He's got a title, but there's someone greater than him. And I think in our lives, we all have to come to that same place because the truth is all of us in this room, we all want to be kings, every single one of us. And like Herod, we spend so much of our lives trying to build up our own kingdom that we want to have that title. We want to have those subordinates. We want to have people obey our decrees. We want to build our castles. We want to retire like kings and do what we want, when we want. We want to have followerships like kings on social media with people commenting and liking us and lifting us up. But the truth is, there's only one king. There's only one. And Herod had been trying to build up his own throne and his own kingdom, and he's coming to the humble realization right there that there's someone better than him. And it's such a sweet spot in life when we all come to that same realization. There's someone better than us. And while success is not a problem, being driven by it so much so that we forget the gift giver and we focus on the gifts, we miss it. And Herod was given a throne by God was given a privilege to lead but he made himself God and so often in America the same thing happens that we take those blessings and we forget we were blessed to be a blessing to the God who gave it all 
and Herod made himself the end all be all. So my question to you is, have you acknowledged there's one king, one king, only one, does not matter your title, there is one greater than you, always will be. And Herod doesn't like that. He's troubled. So in fact, he calls in advisors. Go to verse four. We're told he assembled all the chief priests and the scribes of the people. And he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So he hears the news. These wise men have come hundreds of miles to find a king. He's not the king. And he's trying to figure out where is this king. So he calls in the chief priests, the scribes, the Jewish leaders for all of these Gentiles that are coming in looking for him. And he calls in the sacred, holy Jewish leaders and he says, hey, do y'all know anything about this king? And then they actually gave an answer. Did you catch it? They went to the verse I mentioned in Micah 5 2, the verse we studied last week here in this room. They knew the answer. They immediately tell Herod, hey, if it's really happening and he's here, He's in Bethlehem. He's in Bethlehem because Micah said it would be that way. Yet I find it interesting that none of the Jewish leaders and the scribes and any of those priests are in your nativity scene at home. Not a single one of them. Not a single one of them are in your nativities. And why? It's because they understood the answers. It just didn't impact their heart. That in that crazy that they had waited in 400 years of silence from God, waiting. 700 years before God had said, this is how it's going to happen. Then for 400 years, he said nothing. And then they hear there are people coming from all over the world, chasing a star, looking for the Son of God. And they go, yeah, he's six miles away, but y'all go figure it out. They weren't moved. They heard good news, but they stayed still. But the wise men went. They went to go see the Christ. They went the six miles and they got moving. And what they did is they taught us our second point today. Wise men are moved by the good news. You see, fools hear good news and they do nothing. They do nothing with it. But wise men and wise women hear the good news of Jesus Christ and they say, I want to see him. I want to know him. But so often in life, religion blinds people. It blinds people to think that if I have all the right ideas in my head, that's enough. But you can have all the right ideas and know everything about God, but not actually know him at all. When I was in college, I had a lot of different part-time jobs over the years, but one job I had when I was at Texas A&M was I worked for the College of Architecture. Worked there for probably, I think, a year and a half, two years. And I got a job in the student services office. And what I did at the College of Architecture was I did a lot of administrative work. I'd pick up the phone. I'd work for the guidance counselor, schedule, file, that kind of stuff. But then eventually I kind of got promoted from within to actually give tours to prospective students. So students and their families would come to the College of Architecture to check it out and considering applying, enrolling in the future years. And I was the guy that would walk them around the property and show the facility and explain the programs and do all that. And I enjoyed doing it. But there was one ironic part of it all is that I wasn't in the College of Architecture. I actually really truthfully knew nothing about what I was talking about. But I was well trained and I had a decent memory. So I started to learn all about the programs. I knew all of them. I knew all the details. I knew the degree paths. I knew the studios. I knew the classrooms, the teachers. And I would walk that property as if I belonged there. And I would show these students and families and talk about all the wonderful things in the College of Architecture. And then every now and then, at, somewhere in the tour, a parent would ask, so what year are you here in the college? <laughs> and then I'd have to fess up, well, actually, I'm political science. I'm liberal arts, which means I really don't know what I'm going to do with my life, but I'm a liberal arts guy. I'm just studying, reading, writing papers, but I know a lot about what these guys do. I know exactly what they're going to do. And they'd hear that answer, and they'd always be a little surprised. And it's because I knew all the truth. I knew all the facts. I knew all the details. But I didn't actually belong. And this is what religion does. 
Religion will give you all the facts, all the ideas, all the truths, all the principles. And I would dare say every person in this room, children included, can recite the Christmas story. Religion will do that. It'll give you all the information in your head, but the thing religion will not do is transform your heart. It'll stay up here and never move the 18 inches south. And that will never change you. And foolish people settle for religion. They want to know about God. They just don't want to know him. But wise men and wise women, they hear the good news and they say, I want to meet Jesus. I want to know him. And my question to you is, Frank, it's are you a wise man, a wise woman, or are you a fool? Because those religious leaders are fools. They never moved. They stayed there. They knew the truth, and the truth never set them free. But wise men get up and go. And the wise men, they got up and they went. Herod did not go because he's protecting his own interests. The religious leaders did not go because they were jaded and unmoved. But they went, and Herod told them, go, and if you find him in Bethlehem, he said, let me know so I can come worship him with you. But of course, that was not his intentions, which God revealed to the wise men later, but he sends them off to Bethlehem and see what happens. Flip over to verse 9. We're told, after listening to the king, they, the wise men, went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So they start heading out, and lo and behold, they see that star. And the star's on the move, and they see it there at Bethlehem. And we're told it appears, and they went into a house. So some time has transpired. Some scholars wonder if it could have been up to two years, actually, after the birth of Christ. Time's moved on. They're now in a house. They're not in a cave or a stable or wherever baby Jesus was delivered. But now they're in Bethlehem in a house, and the wise men find their way there. And it says when they get in the house, they fell down and they worshiped him. And I don't want you to miss how crazy that sounds. For these advisors, these Gentiles, non-Jews, showing up and they see a baby and they get on their faces and they start worshiping him. And for many spectators, they would have thought they were fools and they had lost their minds. But they taught us our third point, and it's this. Wise men choose to worship the Christ. Wise men choose to worship the Christ. And I use that word choose purposely because one day we're all going to worship him. Amen. We're actually told in Philippians chapter 2 that when Christ returns, he won't come as a suffering servant. He will come as that triumphant king to take what is rightfully his. And we're told when he shows up, Philippians 2 says, every knee will bow. Not the ones that want to, but every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. We're told all those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow and confess Jesus is Lord. And that day is coming. But wise men choose to do it today. They choose to do it in gratitude, full of thankful hearts, saying you are king. But one day some will be forced to their knees and surrender, saying I'm defeated by the king. But Christ gives us the invitation to come now. Come now and choose him as savior and to bend your knee, bow your knee and to worship him and proclaim him to be rightfully who he is, which is the king of kings and lord of lords. And the wise men get it. They show up, they bow those knees and they start worshiping and they start giving gifts. And the gifts show why they're worshiping. We're told that they gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And the gold, it noted the royalty. It was a gift to a king. They're saying this baby's not a baby. He's a king, the king of kings. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, we're told all things were made through Jesus and for Jesus. It all belongs to him. So the kings are giving this gift of gold saying you are royalty. You are the king. It all belongs to you. But then they also give frankincense. 
And frankincense was a precious incense that was actually used. It would accompany grain offerings and special occasions, and it was known to be a pleasing aroma to God. And they're noting that this isn't just a baby, he's God. And they're giving this incense to be a pleasing aroma to Jesus. But then they also give myrrh. And myrrh was this precious perfume, but if you remember myrrh, it comes, out, comes up a couple times in the Gospels. Jesus was actually offered myrrh mixed with wine to deaden the pain while he was on the cross, which Jesus said no, because he had to take the full cup of God's wrath for me and for you. So he did not have any of his senses dulled. Instead, he said no. And then after he was crucified and he was buried, we're told that actually, once again, myrrh came in with precious ointments to prepare him for that burial. And you see, myrrh was associated with death. And these kings are showing symbolically through our sovereign God that Jesus came as the king of kings, but he's not a normal king. He's the God king. He's God. But yet, even though he's God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself obedient, even to the point of death on a cross. And because of that, he's worthy of our worship. He's worthy. And that is why the wise men drop to their knees. He's worthy. And that's why wise men and wise women today follow their example, because he's worthy. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we're told that we too are called to worship him this season. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. He says, I appeal to you by the mercies of God, in view of God's mercy, present yourselves as an offering, a living sacrifice. And every day that is what we're called to do in view of who God is. In view of what Jesus has done and how he has gained salvation for all of us who would believe, Paul says, give him all you got. And today we give these offerings here as a small offering. And I do believe it is pleasing to God and honorable as we give these gifts in the name of Jesus Christ. But you want to know what the offering is he wants the most? You. He wants you. He doesn't want your stuff. He wants you. He says, that's why you're a living sacrifice. You say, all that I am, all that I have, and all that I'll ever be, it's yours. And wise men and wise men, women come to that humble understanding. Jesus invited all those imperfect guests to come and celebrate on that first Christmas. And he's inviting imperfect people, even here in this room, to come and celebrate and worship him today. But my question is, will you follow the example of those wise men because wise men and wise women worship Jesus.